Welcome to Catholic Light. Join me, Becca Doherty, each week as we shed a little light while keeping the conversation light. Hi, and welcome back to another week of Catholic Light. Today on the second half of the episode, we'll read Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 535 through 560, and we'll talk about the virtue of humility. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said the three most important virtues are humility, humility, and humility. The virtue of humility is, I would say, kind of a foreign concept to our self-promoting culture, and it runs contrary to our fallen human condition, which turns inward instead of outward, uh, which tries to protect and exalt the ego at all costs. So one time I was complaining to my husband, you know, so-and-so is just so critical. I just hate when he gives me unsolicited advice. And Dan said to me, um, do you receive criticism well from anyone? And I was like, well, no, but fine, da. So humility is a beautiful virtue, um, but it's hard because it often requires humiliation, suffering, struggling with others and even or most especially with ourselves. Um, I think of people throughout my life who have each been either arrogant or humble and how incredibly attractive those people are who are humble. It's not necessarily what you know, they say or do, but it's the humble way in which they say or do the things. Um, in some of those people's cases, I know that their humility was won through hard-fought battles. So not only through faithfulness day in and day out to the sacraments, to daily prayer, to fasting, to other voluntary sacrifices, but through sacrifices that came to them against their wills. So through cancer, through unexpected job loss, through a messy divorce, through an insensible loss of a loved one. Each of these battles, these unforeseen, saddening circumstances were embraced, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly, by each individual. And eventually, he or she allowed those humbling and sometimes humiliating circumstances to transform him or her into a more humble person. So it taught these circumstances, taught or reminded the person that each day, our very lives and all of the relationships and blessings that come along with it are pure gift. If you ever get a little too high on your horse about how awesome you are, just remember all that you did to get yourself created and born, which is absolutely nothing. Your life, my life, each and every one of our lives is pure and total gift, graciously given to us because, as my friend Father Matt likes to say, he thought you might like it. God thought you might enjoy this thing called existence. If it ever feels difficult, first remember that it is, but it's so good and the results are worth it. Not only are we made into more beautiful, humble people, but we see the world rightly. So not only are each of our lives a gift, but all of creation is a gift, and we all depend on God for our continued existence. G.K. Chesterton, an author I've referenced a a number of times, wrote a biography on St. Francis of Assisi, and it was the first book he wrote after his conversion to the Catholic faith, and it was a sort of homage to the saint he always felt close to. In Chesterton's book on St. Francis of Assisi, he refers to this incredible saint as the jongleur de Dieu, or God's jester, God's juggler, or God's clown. He said that Francis was like a court jester who lived only to please and entertain and give delight to our Lord and Our Lady. And as a court jester, he often stood on his head, and in standing on his head, he often saw things rightly. So Chesterton says, any scene, such as a landscape, can sometimes be more clearly and freshly seen if it is seen upside down. So he talks about um, tall, large buildings, which we often view and think power, prestige, strength. But he says that Francis, observing them upside down, sees that these large edifices are actually more tenuously connected to the earth from which they dangle. Whereas the little people and things, 
that are close to the ground, for example, those things that are humble, again, viewed upside down, are much better grounded and secure and happy. So if striving for humility or being granted a dose of humility feels difficult, it is. It's hard to be humbled, hard to be humiliated, but it's so good. Second, as in all things, remember that the great exemplar paved the way for us. So Jesus was like us in all ways but sin. He walked every step of our human condition. Are you physically suffering? Remember that Christ physically suffered too at the scourging at the pillar, the crucifixion. Are you emotionally spent? Remember that in the agony in the garden, Christ experienced so much pressure uh, foreseeing what he was about to undergo that scripture says it was as though he sweat drops of blood. Do you feel ridiculed and misunderstood? Again, think of Christ after his arrest or as he's hanging on the cross, people walking by him, taunting him. So you say you're the son of God, save yourself, you know, come off this cross. If you're ever feeling helpless as you watch your children and or other loved ones make poor decisions, remember that sadly Jesus probably experiences that every day. So what does that mean for us? That means that we can turn to the one who understands best because he walked every step of the human journey except sin. So we can turn to the one who understands this best for consolation. In other words, we can talk to him about it. We can also rest assured that it all works out in the end. So Jesus won. We sign up for his team and fight with him, and we too win. And he showed us that this weapon of humility conquers the enemy, whether that's the devil, the world, or our very selves. Today's reading selection includes paragraphs 538 through 540, which discuss Jesus' temptations. The Catechism says, The Gospels speak of a time of solitude for Jesus in the desert immediately after his baptism by John. Driven by the Spirit into the desert, Jesus remains there for 40 days without eating. He lives among wild beasts, and angels minister to him. At the end of this time, Satan tempts him three times, seeking to compromise his filial attitude toward God. Jesus rebuffs these attacks, which recapitulate the temptations of Adam in paradise and of Israel in the desert, and the devil leaves him until an opportune time. The evangelists indicate the salvific meaning of this mysterious event. Jesus is the new Adam who remained faithful just where the first Adam had given in to temptation. Jesus fulfills Israel's vocation perfectly. In contrast to those who had once provoked God during 40 years in the desert, Christ reveals himself as God's servant, totally obedient to the divine will. In this, Jesus is the devil's conqueror. He binds the strong man to take back his plunder. Jesus' victory over the tempter in the desert anticipates victory at the Passion, the supreme act of obedience of his filial love for the Father. Jesus' temptation reveals the way in which the Son of God is Messiah, contrary to the way Satan proposes to him and the way men wish to attribute to him. This is why Christ vanquished the tempter for us. We have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sinning. This passage from the Catechism references the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, verses one through 13, again, the temptation of Jesus. Just like the devil makes empty and alluring promises to Adam and Eve in the garden, so recall in Genesis chapter 3, he says, you certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know good and evil. In other words, God's holding out on you. You could be living a better life than what he's offering you. So, dot, 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 eat of this tree. So too does he make empty and alluring promises to a very hungry and a very tired Jesus who's been in the uh, the desert for 40 days at this point. So in the first temptation, he says, if you were the son of God, command the stone to become bread. In the second temptation, he says, or after showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in an instant, he says, I shall give to you all this power and their glory. All this will be yours if you worship me. Lastly, in the third temptation, he leads him to the parapet or the top of the temple and says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here and the angels will catch you. Jesus has just prayed and fasted for 40 days. He responds with scripture, 
the word of God, to each of the devil's temptations. Jesus, who certainly could have turned the stones to bread, who could have twisted the puny little devil's arm or wing behind his back and said, like, Nabra, you worship me. And who could have jumped off the roof of the temple, been caught by the angels, and then rose up from the ground singing and dancing to a choreographed Alleluia chorus, only to punch the devil in the face and throw him off the parapet of the temple. Wow, Becca, your hypothetical imaginings about God and the devil are quite strange. Weirdo. He didn't. Christ didn't do any of this. He very well could have, but he didn't. What does he do? He humbly and confidently responds. And then as the Gospel of Luke chapter 413 says, the devil departed from him. Dang. Notice it's not a false humility like, oh, Mr. Devil, you're so great. I couldn't possibly meet your demands because I'm just a little carpenter from Nazareth. No, he's God. He knows he can do it because he has all the power in the world, but he also knows it's not the way to do it. Pride, arrogance, sin, and death are defeated by humility, self-sacrificial love, prayer, fasting, the word of God. In other words, all that comes to us from the inner life of the Trinity. So want the devil to flee your life? Want to conquer temptation and sin? Want to rise triumphantly to new life? Look to Jesus who paved the way. First, no false humility. You may have heard it said that humility is truth. So to be humble is to recognize the truth in our lives and in the lives of others. God has given each of us gifts, and we each struggle with sin and temptation. Some seem to be more gifted than the others. So for example, the Blessed Virgin Mary. One might look at her and say like, hey, why why wasn't I conceived without original sin? Well, Becca, you also didn't have to watch your perfect son tortured and killed, so let's call it a draw. Um, And some seem to struggle more than others. When people compliment me on my life, my faith life in particular, uh, I repeat the words of Jesus, without cost I have received, and without cost I have to give. So without cost I have received, without cost I am to give. Um, I've mentioned in, in previous episodes that I just thank God every day for the gift of my life and the gift of my faith, and I pray that God will bless my mom and dad for giving both to me so generously and so efficaciously. Um, I feel like I hit the parent lottery, the parent jackpot. They gave me, again, the gift of my life, the gift of my faith um, in such a way that I couldn't help but live a happy and fulfilled life. However, had that not been the case, had I been born into a different family, so refer to my earlier comment, I did absolutely nothing to get myself born and I did nothing to secure the parents I so wonderfully received. My life might look very different. Um, A friend of mine used to say, given the right circumstances, I'm capable of anything. So had I been born into a different family, had I received a different education, had I fallen in with different friends, my life very well could look very different. So it's mysterious why some get certain gifts while others receive certain struggles. But humility is truth, and to recognize that people's gifts are given them by God, and people's struggles could be due to lots of unforeseen circumstances, uh, is humble. Bishop Robert Barron and Brandon Vaught, uh, the gentleman on the Word on Fire podcast who interviews him, uh, we're talking one time, and Brandon said to, to Bishop Barron, you are a very smart and gifted man, dot, dot, dot. I forget what they were talking about at the time. And Bishop Barron, who is a very smart and gifted man and puts, puts that intelligence and those many gifts to really good use, he very quietly and simply recognized that reality. I forget exactly how he said it, but he recognized, you know, that's true. I am smart and gifted. But he also simultaneously recognized it's all from God and I try to use it well. And it was just beautiful how he said it. It struck me initially um, because so many people, myself included, are often falsely humble and will quickly respond like, no, 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 I'm, I'm not that smart or I'm not that gifted. But he simply recognized like, yeah, I am gifted and that's because God gave me these gifts. And so I'll do my best to put those gifts to good use. So first, no false humility. And second, use the weapons that Jesus used, prayer and fasting, the word of God, humility, which again is the recognition of truth. 
This week, let's consider a source of temptation or an area in our lives that's a battleground and use one of Jesus's tactics to fight it. So if I struggle with eating and drinking too much, I could try fasting for a day. If I struggle with envy and resentment, I could pray very specifically for myself and for that other person whom I envy or resent. I could pray for gratitude for my own gifts and gratitude for the other person's gifts. Thank you, God, for the gifts you've given me, and thank you for the gifts you've given this other person. If I struggle with gossip, I could write down a scripture passage and read it instead of gossiping. So if I'm tempted to gossip, look down at that scripture passage and uh, read over, pray with that passage, the word of God. So I'll work on this. I'm going to pick something this week uh, that's a temptation, an area of my life that I, I struggle with, and by the grace of God, I'll use one of Jesus's tactics to try and fight it. So please pray for me. I'll pray for you. And now we'll take a brief break and then return to read Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 535 through 560. Thanks for sticking around. You are listening to Catholic Light. Thank you for joining me each week as we read through the Catechism of the Catholic Church and discuss some of its beautiful teachings. Welcome back. We'll now read this week's selection from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Mysteries of Jesus' Public Life The Baptism of Jesus Jesus' public life begins with his baptism by John in the Jordan. John preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A crowd of sinners, tax collectors and soldiers, Pharisees and Sadducees and prostitutes, come to be baptized by him. Then Jesus appears. The Baptist hesitates, but Jesus insists and receives baptism. Then the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, comes upon Jesus and a voice from heaven proclaims, This is my beloved Son. This is the manifestation or the epiphany of Jesus as Messiah of Israel and Son of God. The baptism of Jesus is on his part the acceptance and inauguration of his mission as God's suffering servant. He allows himself to be numbered among sinners. He is already the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Already he is anticipating the baptism of his bloody death. Already he is coming to fulfill all righteousness. That is, he is submitting himself entirely to his Father's will. Out of love, he consents to this baptism of death for the remission of our sins. The Father's voice responds to the Son's acceptance, proclaiming his entire delight in his Son. The Spirit, whom Jesus possessed in fullness from his conception, comes to rest on him. Jesus will be the source of the Spirit for all mankind. At his baptism, the heavens were opened, the heavens that Adam's sin had closed, and the waters were sanctified by the descent of Jesus and the Spirit, a prelude to the new creation. Through baptism, the Christian is sacramentally assimilated to Jesus, who in his own baptism anticipates his death and resurrection. The Christian must enter into this mystery of humble self-abasement and repentance, go down into the water with Jesus in order to rise with him, be reborn of water and the Spirit, so as to become the Father's beloved Son in the Son and walk in newness of life. Let us be buried with Christ by baptism to rise with him. Let us go down with him to be raised with him, and let us rise with him to be glorified with him. Everything that happened to Christ lets us know that, after the bath of water, the Holy Spirit swoops down upon us from high heaven, and that, adopted by the Father's voice, we become sons of God. Jesus' Temptations The Gospels speak of a time of solitude for Jesus in the desert, immediately after his baptism by John. Driven by the Spirit into the desert, Jesus remains there for 40 days without eating. He lives among wild beasts, and angels minister to him. At the end of this time, Satan tempts him three times, seeking to compromise his filial attitude toward God. Jesus rebuffs these attacks, which recapitulate the temptations of Adam in paradise and of Israel in the desert, and the devil leaves him until an opportune time. The evangelists indicate the salvific meaning of this mysterious event. Jesus is the new Adam who remained faithful just where the first Adam had given into temptation. Jesus fulfills Israel's vocation perfectly. In contrast to those who had once provoked God during 40 years in the desert, Christ reveals himself as God's servant, totally obedient to the divine will. In this, Jesus is the devil's conqueror. 
he binds the strong man to take back his plunder. Jesus' victory over the tempter in the desert anticipates victory at the Passion, the supreme act of obedience of his filial love for the Father. Jesus' temptation reveals the way in which the Son of God is Messiah, contrary to the way Satan proposes to him and the way men wish to attribute to him. This is why Christ vanquished the tempter for us. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sinning. By the solemn 40 days of Lent, the church unites herself each year to the mystery of Jesus in the desert. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. To carry out the will of the Father, Christ inaugurated the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now the Father's will is to raise up men to share in his own divine life. He does this by gathering men around his son, Jesus Christ. This gathering is the church on earth, the seed and beginning of that kingdom. Christ stands at the heart of this gathering of men into the family of God. By his word, through signs that manifest the reign of God, and by sending out his disciples, Jesus calls all people to come together around him. But above all, in the great Paschal mystery, his death on the cross and his resurrection, he would accomplish the coming of his kingdom. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Into this union with Christ, all men are called. The Proclamation of the Kingdom of God Everyone is called to enter the kingdom. First announced to the children of Israel, this messianic kingdom is intended to accept men of all nations. To enter it, one must first accept Jesus' word. The word of the Lord is compared to a seed which is sown in a field. Those who hear it with faith and are numbered among the little flock of Christ have truly received the kingdom. Then, by its own power, the seed sprouts and grows until the harvest. The kingdom belongs to the poor and lowly, which means those who have accepted it with humble hearts. Jesus is sent to preach good news to the poor. He declares them blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To them, the little ones, the Father is pleased to reveal what remains hidden from the wise and the learned. Jesus shares the life of the poor, from the cradle to the cross. He experiences hunger, thirst, and privation. Jesus identifies himself with the poor of every kind and makes active love toward them the condition for entering his kingdom. Jesus invites sinners to the table of the kingdom. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He invites them to that conversion without which one cannot enter the kingdom, but shows them in word and deed his Father's boundless mercy for them and the vast joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. The supreme proof of his love will be the sacrifice of his own life for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' invitation to enter his kingdom comes in the form of parables, a characteristic feature of his teaching. Through his parables, he invites people to the feast of the kingdom, but he also asks for a radical choice. To gain the kingdom, one must give everything. Words are not enough. Deeds are required. The parables are like mirrors for man. Will he be hard soil or good earth for the word? What use has he made of the talents he has received? Jesus and the presence of the kingdom in this world are secretly at the heart of the parables. One must enter the kingdom, that is, become a disciple of Christ, in order to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. For those who stay outside, everything remains enigmatic. The Signs of the Kingdom of God Jesus accompanies his words with many mighty works and wonders and signs, which manifest that the kingdom is present in him and attest that he was the promised Messiah. The signs worked by Jesus attest that the Father has sent him. They invite belief in him. To those who turn to him in faith, he grants what they ask. So miracles strengthen faith in the one who does his Father's works. They bear witness that he is the Son of God. But his miracles can also be occasions for offense. They are not intended to satisfy people's curiosity or desire for magic. Despite his evident miracles, some people reject Jesus. He is even accused of acting by the power of demons. By freeing some individuals from the earthly evils of hunger, injustice, illness, and death, Jesus performed messianic signs. Nevertheless, he did not come to abolish all evils here below, but to free men from the greatest slavery, sin, which thwarts them in their vocation as God's sons and causes all forms of human bondage. The coming of God's kingdom means the defeat of Satan's. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
Jesus' exorcisms free some individuals from the domination of demons. They anticipate Jesus' great victory over the ruler of this world. The kingdom of God will be definitively established through Christ's cross. God reigned from the wood. The keys of the kingdom. From the beginning of his public life, Jesus chose certain men, 12 in number, to be with him and to participate in his mission. He gives the 12 a share in his authority and sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. They remain associated forever with Christ's kingdom, for through them he directs the church. As my Father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon Peter holds the first place in the college of the twelve. Jesus entrusted a unique mission to him. Through a revelation from the Father, Peter had confessed, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Our Lord then declared to him, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Christ, the living stone, thus assures his church, built on Peter, of victory over the powers of death. Because of the faith he confessed, Peter will remain the unshakable rock of the church. His mission will be to keep this faith from every lapse and to strengthen his brothers in it. Jesus entrusted a specific authority to Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The power of the keys designates authority to govern the house of God, which is the church. Jesus, the good shepherd, confirmed this mandate after his resurrection. Feed my sheep. The power to bind and loose connotes the authority to absolve sins, to pronounce doctrinal judgments, and to make disciplinary decisions in the church. Jesus entrusted this authority to the church through the ministry of the apostles, and in particular through the ministry of Peter, the only one to whom he specifically entrusted the keys of the kingdom. A foretaste of the kingdom, the transfiguration. From the day Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Master began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter scorns this prediction, nor do the others understand it any better than he. In this context, the mysterious episode of Jesus' transfiguration takes place on the high mountain, before three witnesses chosen by himself, Peter, James, and John. Jesus' face and clothes become dazzling with light, and Moses and Elijah appear speaking of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. A cloud covers him, and a voice from heaven says, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. For a moment, Jesus discloses his divine glory, confirming Peter's confession. He also reveals that he will have to go by the way of the cross at Jerusalem in order to enter into his glory. Moses and Elijah had seen God's glory on the mountain. The law and the prophets had announced the Messiah's sufferings. Christ's passion is the will of the Father. The Son acts as God's servant. The cloud indicates the presence of the Holy Spirit. The whole trinity appeared. The Father in the voice, the Son in the man, the Spirit in the shining cloud. You were transfigured on the mountain, and your disciples, as much as they were capable of it, beheld your glory, O Christ our God, so that when they should see you crucified, they would understand that your passion was voluntary, and proclaim to the world that you truly are the splendor of the Father. On the threshold of the public life, the baptism, on the threshold of the Passover, the transfiguration. Jesus' baptism proclaimed the mystery of the first generation, namely our baptism, The transfiguration is the sacrament of the second regeneration, our own resurrection. From now on, we share in the Lord's resurrection through the Spirit, who acts in the sacraments of the body of Christ. The transfiguration gives us a foretaste of Christ's glorious coming when he will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body. But it also recalls that it is through many persecutions that we must enter the kingdom of God. Peter did not yet understand this when he wanted to remain with Christ on the mountain. It has been reserved for you, Peter, but for after death. For now, Jesus says, go down to toil on earth, to serve on earth, to be scorned and crucified on earth. Life goes down to be killed. Bread goes down to suffer hunger. The way goes down to be exhausted on his journey. The spring goes down to suffer thirst. And you refuse to suffer? Jesus' ascent to Jerusalem. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. By this decision, he indicated that he was going up to Jerusalem prepared to die there. Three times he had announced his passion and resurrection. 
Now, heading toward Jerusalem, Jesus says, It cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jesus recalls the martyrdom of the prophets who had been put to death in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, he persists in calling Jerusalem to gather around him. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. When Jerusalem comes into view, he weeps over her and expresses once again his heart's desire. Would that even today you knew the things that make for peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Jesus' messianic entrance into Jerusalem. How will Jerusalem welcome her Messiah? Although Jesus had always refused popular attempts to make him king, he chooses the time and prepares the details for his messianic entry into the city of his father David. Acclaimed as son of David, as the one who brings salvation, Hosanna means save or give salvation, the king of glory enters his city riding on an ass. Jesus conquers the daughter of Zion, a figure of his church, neither by ruse nor by violence, but by the humility that bears witness to the truth. And so the subjects of his kingdom on that day are children and God's poor who acclaim him as had the angels when they announced him to the shepherds. Their acclamation, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, is taken up by the church in the Sanctus of the Eucharistic liturgy that introduces the memorial of the Lord's Passover. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem manifested the coming of the kingdom that the King Messiah was going to accomplish by the Passover of his death and resurrection. It is with, with the celebration of that entry on Palm Sunday that the church's liturgy solemnly opens Holy Week. This brings us to the end of our reading selection of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Thanks so much for joining me this week on Catholic Light. Be sure to connect with me on Instagram at Catholic Light Podcast and share which of the battle tactics have been most effective in your life. So is it prayer, fasting, scripture, acts of humility, maybe something else? I'll be praying for you. Please pray for me, and I'll see you next week. In the meantime, God bless you. Thanks for joining me this week on Catholic Light. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your family and your friends, and connect with me through Facebook and Instagram. I'll see you next week, and in the meantime, God bless you.